is Professor Robert Kennedy, as you know, from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and he's, we have the nitty gritty uh, from Bob, and we're going to get to the heart of the matter. Well, no, 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 but no, Bob, Bob's is very good. The title of his uh, talk is Can the Traditional Incompatibilist or Libertarian Free Will Be Made Consistent with Modern Science? Steps towards a positive answer. Right. Much of what I've done over the years has been an interaction with people like Al Mealy and then in more recent years with Bob anyway, so this is almost a kind of collective enterprise. <clears throat> um, as, the, as my paper notes, I've been dealing with free will issues since the 19, uh, 1960s, and uh, since mid-century, uh, the landscape of the free will debate was a lot simpler than it is today. The assumption was that if you had scientific leanings, you would naturally be a compatibilist about free will believing it to be compatible with determinism. That was back then. Uh, that's if you did not deny free will altogether. And if you were a libertarian about free will, uh, held a traditional view according to which it was incompatible with determinism, you must inevitably, the idea was, appeal to some obscure or mysterious forms of agency to make sense of it, to uncause causes, immaterial minds, uh, numinal selves, non-event agent causes, prime movers, unmoved, uh, and other examples of what P.F. Strawson back then called the panicky metaphysics of traditional defenders of free will. And he had in mind from the ancients to the medievals to Descartes to Kant uh, and others who had appealed to various of these things. Uh, and such a traditional free will was widely thought to, uh, in modernity to be outdated and obscure. Uh, and unfitted to modern scientific images of humans and the cosmos. I quote Nietzsche on this about the cause of sui uh, being the ultimate self-contradiction uh, ever invented by humans. I set out at the beginning of the, uh, in the middle of the 60s to try to move beyond this stalemate by asking whether a traditional libertarian or incompatibilist free will could be reconciled with science without appealing to any of these mysterious uh, agencies that have been used in the tradition. It was a lonely project at that time. Many people thought it was hopeless and told me not even to try. I wouldn't get tenure and all that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, it turned out to be a lot harder than uh, uh, I thought, and it's been going on for 40 years, because it required rethinking the whole problem from the ground up, the history of it and, and everything else. First, rethinking the question of why people believe that free will was incompatible with determinism to begin with. There's a lot of debate on this and a lot of discussion of it, but briefly summarized, I came, came to put the emphasis on something a little different than people were discussing at that time, uh, and, and namely on a condition that was neglected in modern times, but what I argued fueled intuitions about incompatibilism for centuries. I call it the condition of ultimate responsibility, or you are. The basic idea is that to be ultimately responsible for an action, an agent must be responsible for anything that's a sufficient reason, cause, or motive for the actions occurring. Compare Aristotle's claim that if a man is responsible for wicked acts, that determinately flow from his character and motives, he must at some time in the past have been responsible uh, by past choices or actions for forming the wicked character and motives from which this act flows. This is no esoteric principle. It's woven into the very fabric of our ordinary thinking about responsibility in moral and legal contexts. If a drunk driver could not have avoided hitting and killing a pedestrian because of his drunken condition and the conditions of the road, He's not thereby exonerated from responsibility. We have to ask whether he is in any way responsible for being in the drunken condition he is in by his prior actions of drinking and choosing to drive. This basic line of reasoning identified by Aristotle and which is the basis for the condition of ultimate responsibility lies behind our everyday judgments about responsibility. In fact, I find it to be absolutely fundamental and essential. The condition of uh, you are this condition has numerous implications for free will. For example, it doesn't require that we could have done otherwise for every act done of our own free wills, as we often use that expression. But it does require that we could have done otherwise with respect to some acts in our past life histories by which we formed our present characters. I call these self-forming actions or SFAs. Bob uh, has uh, mentioned them. Often we act from a will already formed, but it's our own free will by virtue of the fact that we formed it by other choices or actions in the past, self-forming actions or SFAs, as I call them, for which we could have done otherwise. Think again here of the drunk driver. 
If this were not so, there's nothing we could have ever done differently in our entire lifetimes to make ourselves different than we are. A consequence, I believe, that's incompatible with our being at least some, to some degree ultimately responsible for what we are. And that's what I think free will requires. Yuan also tells us why the traditional problem of free will was about the freedom of the will and not merely about freedom of action. The modern era since the 17th century, as I note, has tried to obscure the difference, thereby oversimplifying the problem. The medievals had a better idea on this one, and here I kind of take issue with, with John Locke uh, uh, on this. Free will, uh, as traditionally understood, was something deeper than freedom of action. It was about self-formation, or how we got to be the kinds of persons we are. Uh, it'd be interesting, I think, to tie this to larger story about the disenchantments of modernity. But I'll forego that. And finally, UI tells us why free will has traditionally been thought to be incompatible with determinism. If agents have to be responsible to some degree for anything such as their prior formed character and motives, that's a sufficient cause or motive for their actions, an impossible infinite regress of past actions would be required unless some actions in an agent's life history, self-forming actions, did not have either sufficient cause, causes or motives and hence were undetermined. This rethinking of the traditional problem in terms of UR doesn't make the free will problem any easier. In fact, it makes it a heck of a lot harder. How can actions lacking both sufficient causes and motives be free and responsible actions? And how, if at all, could such actions exist in the natural order without reducing to either chance or luck? Now, as Bob Doyle notes in, in his instructive and insightful presentation of the recent history of these debates, I believed early on that quantum theory must have something to do with the solution to these problems, but it was really difficult to say what. For most scientists and philosophers had scoffed at suggestions by Compton and Eddington and other people that Bob mentioned uh, that quantum theory made room for free will. That was too simple. Uh, if a choice were to occur as a result of some undetermined quantum events in the brain, the skeptics argued, how could that amount to a free and responsible choice? In fact, the consensus view was that indeterminism in the brain would not enhance freedom and responsibility, but diminish it. Uh, as Bob also notes in his presentation, my first efforts at dealing with this problem in the 70s was to formulate a two-stage model, very much like the one he nicely presents and that Al uh, put forward later and, and, and so on. Um, I thought from the beginning that this must be part of the solution to the free will problem. I initially got onto it through Popper, who was one of the guys that mentioned, who was giving the Compton lecture and went back to Compton too, and I knew uh, Compton's son. Uh, that's another long story, but I'll forego it. Uh, I, um, I thought from the beginning that it must be part of the problem, uh, but uh, I also believe it could not be the complete complete solution, and here I take some issue with Bob, although I agree a lot with a lot of what he has to say and also with Al. Um, uh, hence, I didn't publish anything about it in the 70s because I figured I haven't got the whole solution yet. I just got a part of it. How can you publish a part of it? Uh, and, and then it turned out that Dennett published this article in 78 that Bob mentioned, and I was really distressed because I needed an article to get tenure. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, damn it, I said, I didn't think it was good enough. And even Dennett, of course, he wasn't an incompatibilist. Dennett said, uh, well, here's what libertarians can have this, but uh, it's not all they want, right? And that's what you, you said too, Al. Uh, and so I didn't publish it because I said, well, I haven't got the whole story yet. And then he published it, and damn it, he got tenure, I guess. <laughs> uh, so uh, you, know how that, you all know how that is. And the young fellows in here are worried about that. Uh, but uh, OK. Um, and, uh, and Dennett also believed it was not all that libertarians wanted, but at least provided something. And uh, Al Mealy took the same view uh, somewhat later. And I think they're both correct in that. Uh, and so I made the two-stage model a part of my own theory in, 19, in a 1985 book, uh, but only a part. And I tried to go beyond it. And this is where it gets dicey. Uh, I'm even more con convinced today through the work of uh, Heisenberg as well as others at this conference uh, and so on uh, uh, that uh, the two-stage model uh, is uh, an important part of any adequate theory of free will uh, and then indeed that it's also an important and crucial step in the evolution of human freedom. Perhaps the first if it's all the way down in those early organisms that uh, uh, Martin talked about. Uh, uh, the ability to randomize in lower organisms affords them flexibility and creativity as it does for humans. 
But I believe, as I did in the 70s, that a number of other steps are needed to get from this first crucial evolutionary step to full evolution of free will in human beings, and that the two-stage model must be folded into a larger picture. That's the idea. That picture